Good morning. Well, a very warm welcome to all of you here today. It's wonderful to see all of us gathered for worship this morning, and a very special welcome to any guests that we have with us today. We're so glad that you're here, glad that all of us can be here this morning. We're excited to engage in worship, to meet God in worship, and certainly excited as you see the table set before me here. Uh, to gather together, to share the bread and the cup of our Lord, to rejoice in his goodness and in his grace. And along those lines, uh, just a moment, a word to any guests that we do have with us this morning uh, with respect to your participation with us uh, in this sacrament. Uh, if you are a member of a Bible-believing community, that is to say, if you have stood up publicly and declared your faith and trust in Jesus as your only Savior, and your only Lord, and you have a sincere desire to live for him, well, then you are more than welcome to join us around this table today. But we are here to worship together, to honor and to glorify our God. I want to call us to worship with these words of the psalmist in Psalm 106. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. God is good. Amen? Amen. Amen. God is good. He is loving. He is faithful. And he is here. And we are worshiping him. Let's stand and let's sing together. Congregation God greets his people this morning with these words, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth and all God's people said, amen. amen. Bye. 
you pray with me? God, we are here this morning to worship you with heart and soul and with voice, with all that we are. To worship you, the only true God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because only you are worthy. You have not only given to us the breath in our lungs today, but you have granted to us new life, a resurrected life in the person and work of our Savior, Jesus. And so, Father, we are so grateful to be here today. And we gather with anticipation for what you have for us. And so, Father, we pray that by the movement of your Spirit in this place and in dwelling each one of us, that we would be ready to listen, that our hearts and our ears would be attuned to you today, that we would be ready to respond, not only in this time together, but even as we go from this place into the week that you have planned for us, that we would bear witness to your greatness, to your goodness, and to your grace. Bless us to that end, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we want to move into a time of uh, prayer together as God's people. Right before we do that, just a couple of announcements, just a, a reminder, first of all, 
that our adult Sunday school class uh, on the Shema begins today. We've been hearing about that for a few weeks. That starts today, goes for about five or six weeks or so. So it's a short-term study that I think many of us could uh, commit to. Uh, that starts, I believe, at 11. Is that right? Right around 11 in the East Gathering Room there. And uh, Pastor Noah would be leading that. Uh, then also, I uh, want to highlight here that uh, the Move the Moose fundraiser uh, is starting soon. And you can sign up already for insurance for that, which the very first name on the list, by the way, is mine. <laughs> it's there. All right. So uh, you can look for that. You can't miss the, the moose heads back in the lobby there. Uh, you'll find uh, information there. There is a flyer in your church mailbox, too. Then this Wednesday night, another Wednesday night activity for us. And uh, Judy wants uh, to let all of us know that it is taco night. So you'll want to come out for that. Whether or not uh, you participate in any of the activities is beside the point. Come out for supper and enjoy the, the wonderful food and fellowship together as well. So prayer items as we think about things. Uh, I want you to know that uh, Evelyn Slager uh, fell and uh, broke her pelvis. So she's been in the hospital for the past uh, couple of days, but she has just recently now moved to Freedom Inn for rehab. So if you would remember Evelyn, she's in, in great spirits, uh, but just pray for God's healing uh, for her. Then we received this note in our emails too. I want to make sure we're all aware and be praying for uh, the missionaries that we support to Japan, Young and Misuk Go. Uh, pray for them as Misuk has recently been diagnosed with thyroid cancer and has surgery upcoming that hasn't been scheduled yet, but it will be. And then finally, uh, many of us, of course, recognize the name uh, Al Ingersman. Uh, excuse me, Inglesman. Did I say that right? I'm sorry if I did not. Um, we know that that's Annabelle Lover's uh, son-in-law. I believe I have that correct. Uh, he has been battling a long time with cancer. We know that. And he passed away on Friday. And so uh, visitation is going to be from 2 to 6 today at the uh, Langland Sternberg Funeral Home. And then the funeral service will be tomorrow, uh, Monday, at 11 o'clock in the morning at Oakland CRC. So take note of those things and certainly uh, be praying for those, uh, those folks too. So let's go to God in a time of prayer together. Heavenly Father, Lord, how good it is to be in your house today, to be able to gather here together to worship you and to praise you and to rejoice in your holy name and to recognize and to say publicly and without fear that you are the only true God and that you are the only one worthy of our worship, the one who was and is and forever will be. And to, to say together and to know together in our heart of hearts that you are truly a good God. And we are so grateful to be here to worship you today. Father, we come before you with excitement in our hearts to be sure, but we also come before you in a humility. And we acknowledge that you are God and that we are not. And we are seeking your forgiveness again for the times when we have forgotten that. For the times when, quite frankly, we have forgotten you and that we live even as though you do not exist. Father, for those times, we truly seek your forgiveness and we seek that forgiveness only in the name and for the sake of Jesus, your Son and our Savior, the one who died on the cross for our sins, the one who rose again for our salvation. And Father, even as we consider that, our hearts are full of gratitude. And we are so thankful for all the blessings of your grace, for the lives that you have given to us, for the new life we have in Jesus, for salvation, even the hope of everlasting life, for the purpose that you have granted to us in the here and now, to declare the glories of, of the one who has called us out of darkness into his wondrous light. Yeah. Father, most of all, we are thankful for Jesus. Father, we're thankful for this church. We're thankful for each and every person affiliated with this congregation. We're thankful for how you have blessed us in the past. We're thankful for how you are blessing us now and even thankful for how we know you will bless us in the future, as this is your church. Father, you promised that not even the gates of hell would overcome your church, and we are so thankful for that. 
Father, we pray today for those whom we are aware of, who have need of our prayers this morning. We think of those who've recently lost loved ones, for the Inglesman family and, and their loss today. Father, we know that for some time, uh, Al had been battling cancer, and you have called him home now to be with you. You have given to him that ultimate healing. But we pray for Cindy, we pray for Annabelle, and so many others who will miss him dearly. And we pray for that time of visitation today, for the funeral service tomorrow, Lord. We pray that our hope in Christ would come across so clearly and would give great comfort in loss. Father, we think too in our wider community of the Hemeke family and their sudden loss of Marissa in a car accident. We think of the other kids that were in the car too, for Will and for Lucas and for Cece. Father, we know Will continues to, uh, to have issues with a head injury and there's great concern. And we pray that you would bring healing into his life too. If that be your will, we know you can do that. Father, we continue to pray for the Gensing family too in the loss of Ron. Father, continue to give comfort and peace. Father, be with Evelyn as she deals with this broken piece of her body. Father, we're thankful for just the wonderful spirit that she has. Father, we would pray that healing would come through this time of rehab, that that would go well for her. We continue to pray for Larry as he recovers from his shoulder surgery. Father, we pray for patience uh, for him and for that healing to go quickly. For Ms. Sukgo, and she deals with this diagnosis of thyroid cancer. Surgery is coming. Father, we pray for that too. Father, we pray that you would restore to, to full health and strength, again, if that be your will. Father, we, we know of so many things going on in our church community too in this fall season of the year. We think of our Wednesday night activities again, and we have another one upcoming this Wednesday. We're so thankful for that opportunity. We're thankful for those who, who serve and thankful for those who lead the various groups and for all of those who participate. Father, continue to bring even more out to those Wednesday night activities. Father, we pray for, for our council, for our elders, for our deacons. Thankful for all of the work that they do. Pray that as a congregation, we would be in constant prayer for them, supporting them, encouraging them. Father, through all of it, uh, and in your church here, your name would be glorified. Father, certainly we think of things going on around us in our nation. We do continue to pray for, for all of our representatives, for our governor, for our president. We know that they navigate a variety of different challenges. Uh, Father, we pray for them. Father, for those... Uh, uh, who are sensitive to your call in their lives. We pray that they would seek your leading and your guidance. And Father, that in those uh, who aren't, that you would work in their hearts too. And Father, more and more our country would begin to look to you, and would seek your face. And as you uh, promise in your word that you would heal our land in the ways in which we need to be healed. Father, we again thank you for this opportunity of worship, for the glorious day you have given to us, for this season of autumn and the beauty that it brings. Father, we know all of this is a reflection of who you are, of your goodness and your grace. We give this time to you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray, in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Well, I'd like to invite you to, uh, to open up your Bibles, if you would, and turn in them to Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah in the Old Testament, chapter 40. We're going to take a look at verses 25 through 31, and you're going to find that, I believe, on page 1733 there in your pew Bibles, or right around there. This uh, is a, a, a passage, at least a chapter, I think, that we're very familiar with, especially maybe around the time of Advent. We hear the beginning verses of this chapter, comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. But we're going to be looking at the closing verses uh, of this chapter today, verses 25 through 31, 
And we're going to get to those verses in just a moment, but I just want to invite you to, to keep your Bibles open and be ready uh, to look there when we turn our attention there. But certainly, uh, as many of us know, just a couple of weeks ago, we entered into a, a new series, a series on hope. Uh, it is a series subtitled, Your Heart's Deepest Longing. And if you remember, as we entered into this series, we did so with the observation that, uh, that hope is absolutely indispensable as if for each one of us as we journey through this life. Uh, Edward Council, we, we had a little quote that he had. He said, hope is the spur of life. In other words, hope is what pushes us on in life. Hope is what gives us the, the energy and the enthusiasm we need to really forge forward. Because without hope, we just kind of spin and sputter. And of course, as we noted, that's where exactly a lot of people in the world today find themselves. They're just kind of spinning and sputtering. They're, they're really running dangerously low on hope. But you know, even as we acknowledge that, we also want to acknowledge today that it's not only people out there in the world that are really running dangerously low on hope, but that it's God's people as well. And one of the telltale signs of running low on hope is feeling defeated and discouraged, right? Feeling tired and weak, feeling weak and weary, feeling faint, right? All of these are, are symptoms of a life that is running dangerously low on hope. Well, to all such people, and really to all of us here today, Isaiah has a good word to share, and it's a word that directs our attention once again to the God of all hope. Now, many of us, I'm sure, know this when it comes to the prophecy of Isaiah. But uh, for, for those of us who may not be as familiar to this, to this wonderful book of the Bible, it's a prophecy that is written and directed primarily toward a, a pre-exilic nation. In other words, Isaiah is writing it to God's chosen people knowing full well that the northern kingdom of Israel, because by this point we've got two separate kingdoms, the one uh, united kingdom has split into two. We've got 10 tribes in the north, uh, that's Israel. We've got two tribes to the south, that's Judah. But Isaiah is writing here and he's saying, I know full well what's going to happen. He says, God's revealed this to me. The northern kingdom is very soon going to be overcome by the nation of Assyria. Following that, a few years down the road, the southern kingdom of Judah is going to be overcome by the nation of Babylon. And Isaiah also knows by the Spirit of God that the northern ten tribes of Israel at that point are really essentially going to cease to exist. And that the southern two tribes of Judah will be in captivity for 70 years. And on top of that, Isaiah also knows, again by God's Spirit, that during those 70 years of captivity in Babylon, that God's people are going to begin to despair. And they're going to start to question. They're going to start to wonder, does God care about what's going on? Can he even do anything about it? Well, to those people, and to us today, many of us who who do feel that way, that sense of despair when it comes to a variety of things that happen in our lives. Isaiah writes these wonderful words. And as he does, he gives to God's people both then and now a fresh vision, a fresh vision of God's power, a fresh vision of God's love, and a fresh vision of God's sufficiency. So let's turn our attention there, verses 25 through 31 of Isaiah chapter 40. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name. By the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. 
His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So as far as we want to read in God's word this morning, and may he bless his word to us today. Now, I would imagine that those words I just read for us uh, aren't brand new for the vast majority of us here today. Most of us probably recognize those words. In fact, for some of us, uh, they may be even some of our favorite words in the Bible, particularly those last two verses, right? Uh, The one about the eagles. Maybe you even have a a plaque or a picture in your home that references uh, this particular verse. That wouldn't surprise me at all. But really, the entire text is a timely reminder for us today, even as it was for for God's people some 2,600 years ago, that when we find ourselves at the end of our rope, when we are feeling defeated and discouraged, that God is the only one who can lift us up, that he is the only one who can renew our strength. And Isaiah reminds us of that in a few ways. And first of all, the very first thing he references here and wants us to to understand, to know, to really take into our heart is that God is the all-powerful one. Right? Isaiah talks about this in the first couple of verses of our text, verses 25 and 26. To whom will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Oh, Isaiah is very clear here, isn't he? I mean, absolutely no one can compare to the Holy One of Israel. Right, all the other so-called gods of the nations, right? Whether it's the, the gods of the, uh, of the Babylonians, whether it's the gods of the Assyrians or any other gods, they cannot compare to the God of Israel. Now, let's take the, the gods of, of Babylon, for, for example. The, the Babylonians, they, they favored worshiping the, the heavenly bodies, right? As many in times past have done, right? They worshiped the sun and the moon and the stars. But, but here Isaiah cuts in, he says, well, how did they get there in the first place? Who created these? Who brings out all the stars at night? Who puts them in their right places? Who knows them all by name? He says, this is the Lord God the only true God, because of his power, not one is missing. And so Isaiah basically communicates to God's people both then and now, if you're feeling discouraged, if you're feeling defeated, and what happens when we feel that way? We tend to walk around like this, and we're just looking at the ground, we're looking at our feet, we're looking at our our own belly button. And when you feel like that, Isaiah says, take your eyes off your belly button and look around you. Look at the wonder and the splendor of the universe. And remember, it didn't just happen by chance. Right? God created all of this. In fact, he merely spoke and it came to be. Right? This is our God a God of incredible power, a God whose power knows no limits. One person very helpfully, I think, put it this way, just to give us a little perspective here. said, if you've ever been in the country on a clear night, you've noticed that the heavens sparkle with stars not visible in the city. Now, with your eyes, you can see about 2,000 stars. With seven power binoculars, you can see 50,000 stars. With with a three-inch telescope, you can see hundreds of thousands. Now, the red giant, called Betelgeuse, is so far away that the light we see from it first left the star before Columbus sailed for America. Furthermore, 
If you were to travel 186,000 miles per second, it would take you over 10,000 years just to travel across our galaxy, the Milky Way. And yet ours is just one of countless galaxies in the universe. In fact, astronomers believe the universe extends from Earth for at least 10 billion light years. If the greatness of the universe seems incomprehensible, how much more the greatness of our God? God is all powerful. But at the very same time, as Isaiah goes on here in our text, he says, listen, not only is God all-powerful, but God is also all-loving. Right? He says in verse 27, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by God? So essentially here, Isaiah confronts the people's concerns here that God doesn't care about them. That yeah, he might be powerful, but maybe he's just this big muscle deity who really doesn't have a heart for his people. Their trouble, their concerns. Well, into that, Isaiah speaks again in verses 28 and 29, doesn't he? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. Yes, he's the creator of the ends of the earth. But he doesn't faint. He doesn't grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. And then these words. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. In other words, God isn't just all powerful. He's also all loving, right? To those who are faint, he gives power. To those who, are, who have no might, he gives strength. In other words... He cares. He cares about his people's struggles. He cares about their concerns. He cares about their challenges. His heart is not only open for his people, but his heart is actually directed toward his people. He loves his people. And he stands ready to give them anything and everything they need to endure. And not just to endure, but actually to overcome. And that's something that God's people in captivity would need to hear. Can you imagine that? They would need to hear that. I mean, they would need to understand and to know that God hadn't forgotten about them. That God, in fact, has a plan for them. And that as much as God's people then would need to hear that, God's people today, you and I, we need to hear it. God doesn't forget about one of his children. Each and every one of us as God's kids, we are firmly fixed on his radar. He cares about the littlest detail of our lives. I mean, inasmuch as his power is unsearchable, his love is unimaginable. And if you doubt that, Listen closely, if you doubt that, even for a second, then look at the cross. Just look at the cross. Because you need to understand and we need to see that if God doesn't love us, he would not have sent Jesus. If God doesn't love us, then Jesus would never have suffered and died on that cross for our sins. If God doesn't love us, then he would have left us in our sin, destined only for an eternity separated from him. But you see, God does love us. And he cares about us more than we can truly know. Right, Jesus put it this way in his Sermon on the Mount. We, we remember these words, but let's listen to them in this context. Jesus says, you know, my father, he cares about the birds of the air. He cares even about the flowers of the field. They're here today, tomorrow they're gone. They're thrown into the fire. But my father cares about them. How much more 
speaking now to the crown of his creation, humanity itself, how much more does God care about you? So God is all-powerful. And God is all-loving. But Isaiah doesn't even stop there, does he? And he goes on and he reminds us too that God is all sufficient. That he is everything we could ever need. This is the way Isaiah puts it in those well-known verses, verses 30 and 31. Even youths shall faint and be weary. Young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount upon wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. And again, Isaiah's point is clear. Right? God's supreme power, God's everlasting love, prove him to be the only one who can finally and fully reinvigorate our spirits. The only one who can renew our strength. And I want to draw our attention to one word here particularly. That's the word renew. That's the key word here. And that word renew, it actually means exchange. As in a, a change of clothing. And the picture here is that when we trust in God, when we trust in the Lord, right? When we throw ourselves into his care, well, then he's going to take our weakness and he's going to take our weariness and he's going to strip it off. And he's going to dress us. He's going to clothe us in his strength. And I want us to hear that very, very clearly. Because Isaiah is not saying here that God's just going to give you a little bit more strength. No, God's going to give you his strength. You see, that's why... He can go on to say that those who trust in God, they're the ones who are going to soar on wings like eagles. They're the ones who are going to run and not grow weary. They're the ones who are, going to, who are going to walk and not be faint. Because it's not the case that God's just going to give us a little bit of a, an extra burst of energy, like one of those souped-up sports drinks that inevitably leaves us hitting a wall about five hours later, right? No. No. We're going to soar on wings like eagles. We're going to run and not grow weary. We're going to walk and not be faint. Because we'll have God's power pulsing through us. And God is all sufficient. He is everything we could ever need. You know, it's very possible, even I would say very probable, that some of us here today, we need to hear this message. We've come here today, and we've got our Sunday clothes on, and we've got our Sunday smiles on, but that's not the way we feel inside. And we're feeling defeated. And we're feeling disheartened. We're struggling. Things in life just aren't going so good right now. For one reason or the other. And we're wondering, does God really care? Can he even do anything about it? See, for those of us who feel that way, for all of us really, because we all feel that way at one time or another, Isaiah says, let me tell you about your God. He is all-powerful. He is all-loving. He is all-sufficient. There is not one problem that you can come up against that is more powerful than him. He is more powerful than any problem you will ever face. He is more loving than you could ever dare to imagine. That he loves you so much 
that he would send Jesus to die on the cross for your sins and then to rise again for your salvation. And that he stands ready to clothe you in his strength. The call of Isaiah is simply this. Put your trust in God. Trust in his goodness. Trust in his grace. And by the way, that's a a grace and a goodness that we see so very clearly displayed right here in this table. As Isaiah says, Wait expectantly for his deliverance because he will not disappoint you and he will fill you with hope. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your good word today. So grateful for for Isaiah and the prophecy that you inspired him to write. And as we recognize, it's not merely stuck in a time and a place for God's people then, but it's alive and it's active and it's for God's people today. It's for us. And we are so very thankful for that. Because all of us, we need this good word And we need to be reminded that you, O God, are all-powerful. That you, O God, are all-loving. That you, O God, are all-sufficient. Father, we pray today that even as we approach this table in just a moment, and as we celebrate your goodness and your grace, that that would inspire us more and more to heed the call of Isaiah And to place our trust firmly in you and only you. And know that you will never disappoint us. And that you will always fill us with hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we approach the table this morning, I'd like to read for us question and answer 81 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Who are to come to the Lord's table? And the answer, those who are displeased with themselves because of their sins, but who nevertheless trust that their sins are pardoned and that their continuing weakness is covered by the suffering and the death of Christ, and who also desire more and more to strengthen their faith and to lead a better life. Friends, would you rise and sing resurrecting the song of hope?
our crucified and resurrected Jesus said these words in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us lift up our hearts to the Lord. Let us lift them up to the God of our salvation. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it and said to them, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was given for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. After supper, he took the cup. Gave thanks. And offered it to them saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Take, drink, remember, and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. I'd like to invite us to respond together with the words that you'll see on the screen behind me. These words are from Psalm 103. Verses 1 through 5, let's say them together. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems my life from the pit and crowns me with love and compassion. He satisfies my desires with good things so that my youth is renewed like the eagles. Well, we're going to respond right now in praise and thanksgiving. We're going to take an offering. The offering is for uh, the cause of benevolence, and the song is Cornerstone.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and grant you his peace all days, every day. Amen.